Father, we come before you this morning and we sing songs that celebrate what this day is all about. Ultimately, that Jesus walking out of the grave, he is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is our Lord and our Savior. He has redeemed us from our transgressions. He has made us new. The old has passed away. And we can look forward to the day when we will be with Him forever. Because just as Jesus was resurrected, so will we be. Lord, we can come today and celebrate and worship because we know that death is not the end. And that our life is more than just 70 to, if we're lucky, 90 years of futility. You gave us meaning and purpose. And for that, we can rejoice. Lord, we are grateful that you've allowed us to live in a place where we can gather and celebrate. But we do lift up those this morning who are putting their lives on the line to celebrate the resurrection of their Lord and Savior. Those who, if they did die, would rejoice. We struggle with that here in the comfort of the United States of America. But we lift them up to you. We pray for their safety. We pray that they can live in a place where they can freely worship in spirit and in truth. Lord, we pray for our land. We pray for the leaders as we are taught. We pray for Christian wisdom in the midst of the insanity that is the world we live in today. And Lord, I pray that we as followers of Jesus would be reminded, especially on a day like today, that in the midst of all of this crisis, chaos, pain, confusion, and suffering, we have hope. And we can put a smile on our face because Jesus is alive. That smile doesn't have to be fake. It doesn't have to be lipstick and mascara. It doesn't have to be a masquerade. Because we know that Jesus rose from the dead. And we thank you. And we thank you that that power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Lord, may we learn to surrender to that power and let you do what only you can do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This is Tina. Say hi, Tina. Hi, Tina. She said hi, too, by the way. <laughs> And the second thing and most important thing is, Tina, I need to ask you, if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Thank you. upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning and welcome to Living Hope. My name is Jeannie Greenman, and these are the ways that you can get involved with our church this week. There is still time to support our team going to South Africa. You can bring any donations of blankets or baby clothing to the church office. They will distribute them while they're there. So donate today. Have you had a chance to check out our online shop? If not, you can find it at lhchd.org shop. Don't forget, our extravaganza is happening today at 11.30, right after the service.
so stick around. You won't want to miss it. On the back of the seat in front of you, there are some QR codes, or they're in the chat on the online service. This is how you can learn more about how to get involved with our church. Here at Living Hope, we believe in taking the next steps in your spiritual walk, and we want to help you do that. So click welcome if you're new to us and you just want to get a little bit more information on us, because we'd love to get some information from you about what you're looking for in a church, what you're interested in, whatever it is that you have to say. Next to the welcome code, you will see a serve code. This is how you get involved in working with one of our ministries. There are so many great opportunities to serve God at our church, and we would love to have you join us in that. If you would like to support Living Hope financially, you'll notice we pass the plates. We also have some black boxes at the back of the sanctuary where you can drop off your tithes and offerings after the service. Or you can scan the gift code on the seat back in front of you and make your donation electronically. We want to make sure that everyone is comfortable however they choose to give. Thank you for joining us at Living Hope. We know that we're going to enjoy getting to know you, and we hope that you enjoy getting to know us. Have a great week. Amen. 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 It is great to see you here this morning. If you have a Bible, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And for this service, as you guys probably already know, the egg hunt for the kids. We're still doing it. It's going to be indoors. We're going to make it work. Make it work for the kids that are here. They'll be after the second service, so around 1130 uh, as, we, as we do that. I had a, a, a friend of mine who uh, does the sunrise service at Knott's Berry Farm, and they had to move it into the theater this morning. And so they were all, everybody was scrambling to figure it out. This, and winter is not going away very easily this year. So, amen. It's a great day, isn't it? You could be someplace else, but you're here. Amen. You know the gospel is ours as the church. We're the ones tasked with it. We can talk about a lot of different kinds of things, and we do in church. We can preach and teach about many different kinds of things in church, about this or that or the other thing. But the gospel is essential and essential for us. It's why we exist. It's why the church exists. And the gospel doesn't exist until this element here that we're going to talk about today, the day that we celebrate, you need resurrection to have a gospel. And we have one. And so as you guys know that if you've been here for any length of time, for those you may be watching online, Easter for me is always 1 Corinthians 15. You may not know what I'm going to preach next week or last week, but you will know that on Easter Sunday every year I will preach from 1 Corinthians 15. It's essential. Paul's talking about that. And he talks through the, the nature of the resurrection. And we're going to walk our way through it this morning. I'm going to start by reading the first ten verses, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into this. Amen? Amen. Paul says, Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preach to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold to the message I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then the twelve. Then He appeared to over five hundred brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for a wonderful time of worship. Thank you for this day to celebrate. Father, as we pray every week, I pray as we open your word that I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. It's what today's all about. Make us more like Jesus for your glory and your kingdom. 
We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, there are times and seasons when we feel like we need something new to start over, to create a, a different story. We started this journey on Friday night at our service of darkness, and if you were here, you were blessed. If you weren't here, I'm so sorry you weren't here because you would have been blessed. It was a great time of reflection upon the cross, upon the atonement that Jesus provided by paying the price for our sins in our place. We, we was reflective. We read through the passion story. We took communion. We nailed things to the cross that needed to be nailed to the cross so that we can have a new beginning. Because Friday night was about, if you want to have a new beginning, something or someone has to die. But today we're here in our bright clothes, some of you. Some of you are Johnny Cash and you just didn't know it. Black velvet, and that's the only way you go. Amen. But I, we are intentional around here about making Easter a celebration. It's a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Yes, he died, but three days later the stone was rolled away and he walked out. And so that there's no confusion about any of these things that, that Paul starts to talk about here from us as a church, we believe that Jesus physically walked out. He wasn't a ghost. It wasn't some, as the Jesus Seminar liked to say, I heard John Dominic Cross say one time, when I think of resurrection, I think of a life. And it's like, where's the physical part of that? No, he didn't, couldn't buy that. Man knew the New Testament better than most of us know the New Testament, but yet he couldn't buy resurrection, which makes you wonder, what do you have faith in? We'll talk about that. But we have seasons. You know, at New Year's, we all make resolutions. They last about two and a half weeks on average, I think is what the average is, and then we're back at it. Amen. But Easter is also a time when many people start thinking about things, because Easter seems, even in our world today, Easter seems to be a time when people think about spiritual matters, because it seems to be more put in front of us this time of year more than any other time of the year, even in, in what you would consider more secular media environments and those types of things. And as you know, we all have our cultural things when it comes to this, but I don't really want to focus on that today. I want to focus on new beginnings. Easter is one of those times of seasons, folks. I don't care how old you are to look back, reflect, and say maybe it's time to do something new, something different. As followers of Jesus, we know. Say we know. We know. Say it again. We know. That God is a God of new beginnings. How do we know that? Because we're all in here as followers of Jesus believe that with all of our hearts. And because of the new beginnings, I'm sorry, because of new beginnings, it's all because of the resurrection of Jesus. Paul's making this point as we walk through this passage. We know we can have a new beginning because of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. That's what verses 1 through 10 have told us. He just passed on what he'd been told and learned. Paul had experienced the resurrected Christ himself on Acts chapter 9 when Jesus appeared to him. And we'll talk probably more about that a little bit later. We have the gospel accounts. He was seen by the 500, by the 12, by the apostles, by Paul. It's so funny to me in the modern age today how somebody can write something on X or on Facebook or on Instagram and be totally false, and you can get 100,000 people to believe it. Yet people don't want to buy this. Buy this. Jesus rose from the grave. He appeared to well over 500 people. If 
That's the reality. It's because he physically rose from the grave that we experience a new beginning. We can experience a new beginning. And you, my friend, you can have a new beginning as well. I want to kind of work my way through this rather quickly because I have some things I want to get to near the end of our message, and I want to respect the time that we have today. We know that we can have a new beginning because our faith demands it. Verse 11 Where am I at? There I am. Whether then desire they, we proclaim, and so you have believed. Verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? How can you say that you're a follower of Jesus and not say there's a resurrection? People do that. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God, because we have testified wrongly about God that He raised up Christ, whom whom He did not raise up if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. We don't like words like vain and worthless when it comes to what we believe. Amen. You are still in your sins. Then those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished if we have put our hope in Christ for this Life only. We should be pitied more than anyone. You know, I often wonder why people, why would anybody say, I'm going to follow Jesus just for this life? It just makes no sense. It's it's a lack of understanding of who Jesus is. I mean, if you're going to be Jesus being a great philosopher or something like that, then I guess you could say, I just want to follow the teachings of Jesus. Just like you can go to Barnes & Noble today, and Stoicism, a Greek way of life, is is all the rage. You can go find a whole Stoic section now. There's a Stoic society here in America. Just follow the philosophy of Plato or Socrates. or Pick your poison. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. As followers of Jesus, our proclamation of the gospel is by faith, and it is a faith that walks out these doors just as confident about Jesus having risen from the dead as when you walked in these doors to raise your hands and pray and say, Brother and sister, to somebody who thinks just like you. We have a reality that we hope for. Resurrection. We weren't there. We believe the testimony of the Scriptures and the Gospels. Got to have faith. It is the proof of what is not seen. You haven't seen heaven, but you live your life as if it's right there, as if it's real. We can have a new beginning because our faith demands it. We believe God changes lives. We believe God has changed our lives. Does it mean you're perfect? I love how imperfect people who don't want to follow Jesus sit there and just constantly look at our imperfections in life as validity for them not believing. We don't claim to be perfect in our own strength and in our own ways. We all have our work in progress signs go hanging over our necks. Amen? Now that doesn't give us an excuse to walk around like a bunch of fools either. Our faith says Jesus rose from the grave. It has to. 
Otherwise, why are we here? What are we doing here? And I don't know about you, but I've, I've lived my life, raised my family on a lie, if, that's not, if this isn't true. Your faith as you've journeyed through life, things probably could have been a little bit easier for you if you didn't have faith. If you didn't rise from the dead, it was all worthless. What's the point? I'll get to more of that in a moment. We know we can have a new beginning because Jesus rules and reigns because he was resurrected, verses 20 through 28. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That means death, by the way. That's a reference for those. Uh, that's what the, the New Testament often uses that expression to talk about those who have died. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. In Adam all die. Who's in Adam? We were all in Adam at one time. We've talked about this going through Genesis. So in Christ all will be made alive. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be made alive in that sense. We're only alive if we are in Christ. See, the interesting thing about resurrection, if you know your end times, and if you don't, here's going to give you a heads up. We all get resurrected at some point. It's just the results of that resurrection that really matter. But each is in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father and he abolishes all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. Amen. The last enemy to be abolished is death, for God has put everything under his feet. Now when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. When everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. I love what Paul says in Philippians, familiar passage many of us know. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. We say this a lot. This is true. But here's the deal. For those of you who believe or don't believe, everybody is going to get resurrected. And everybody is going to call him Lord. I ain't calling him Lord. Yo, yeah, you will. I love our arrogance. It's like the little pipsqueak kid who talks all confident about he's going to take somebody out until he sees who he's got to take out. Then all of a sudden, confidence fades and willingness goes away. See, the great thing about Jesus has done, what God has done for us, is that we can confess him as Lord now, as we should. Because when the time comes and we're all resurrected, and if you're not in Christ, you decided not to call him Lord in this life, Jesus is pretty clear, Paul's pretty clear, you're going to call him Lord. But at that point, those of us who call him Lord now will wonderfully call him Lord Jesus. We look forward to it. We can't wait for it to take place. Those of you that don't, you're going to walk up to Jesus and you're going to say, look at my life. I was a good guy. I was a good girl. I'm a good girl, I am. A little movie reference for all you guys out there. And God's going to say, Jesus is going to say, yeah, you may have been good, but you weren't good enough.
every human will call Jesus Lord because that is who he is. We can be blessed and recognize it now or we can face judgment at the end. That's just Bible. Basic Bible. Confess, agree that Jesus is Lord. (laughs) We're all going to do it. We're all going to do it. To have a new beginning, you have to do that. It's recognizing his rule and reign now. We know we can have a new beginning because of the stories we have seen and heard. Verse 29, otherwise... What will they do who are being baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised up at all, then why are people baptized? What are people baptized for then? There were people even then trying to baptize the dead. They understood the importance of the symbolism of that. Why are we in danger every hour? Paul's saying, why, why, am I dealing, why am I doing all this? Why am I in prison? Why am I dealing with persecution? Why am I getting kicked out and having to be lowered down and all these things? I face death every day. Just as many followers of Jesus, not in America, face death every single day. As surely as I boast about you, brothers and sisters in Christ our Lord, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus as a mere man, what good did that do me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. How many of you, well, let me just throw this thought out there. I see a lot of Christians living that way today. They call themselves followers of Jesus, but yet they say, let's eat, drink, be merry, or tomorrow we die. It's not how God wants us to live. We'll talk about that in a moment. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. (laughs) Too bad we unfortunately want to learn that the hard way most of the time. I'm just as guilty as anybody else. Come to your senses and stop sinning, for some people are ignorant about God. And I say this to your shame. Remember, he's talking to the Corinthians. He's had issues with the Corinthians. He's trying to help rectify and deal with some of their, their, their behaviors and actions that have taken place within the life of the church. But he's, Paul is sharing the story. He's like, you know, his own story. Why, why go through this? Why, why go through this testimony? And you know, the funny thing about it is he knows it's going to happen. Why does he know this is how his life is going to be? Because when Jesus was, when he came to Jesus in Acts chapter 9, when Jesus came to him, Paul was kind of told that his purpose in life, and then he was also told how it was going to happen. He was told he's going to have a hard life. He was told that. I love the road to Emmaus. The Emmaus walk. Those two guys just walking along, with trying to contemplate all the events that are happening and all this stuff, trying to figure all this stuff out. And then in Luke 24, beginning in verse 31, it says, Then their eyes were opened. Why? Because Jesus came up to them. He's, he's, Jesus is playing dumb with them. It's great. What happened? What's going on? What's everybody all crazy about? Where have you been, dude? Then it says, Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, Weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? That very hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together who said, The Lord has truly raised up, raised and and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to describe what had happened on the road and how he was made known to them in the breaking of bread. We have people, we have church history, we have our own stories to tell that testify to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. We know we can have a new beginning because it takes a new body to have a new beginning. Verse 35, but some will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will will they have when they come? You fool! 
What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. In order to have new life, something's got to die. And as for what you sow, you are not sowing the body that will be, but only a seed, perhaps of wheat or another grain. But God gives it a body, gives a body as he wants. Who gets to choose the body you have? All of y'all making deals with, the, with God right now, right? Yeah, God, I'll go for 18, you know. Yeah. He decides. And to each the seeds of his own body. Not all flesh is the same flesh, for there is one flesh for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is different from the earthly ones. There is a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars. In fact, one star differs from another star in splendor, so that it is with the resurrection of the dead. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Like the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. Like the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. Amen. We look forward to a resurrected body because Jesus rose from the grave. What is that body going to look like? Only The only thing we really have as testimony is Jesus' body after he rose from the dead. After he appeared to over 500 people. We see some of the things. I get that Jesus is God and maybe some things there, but there are certainly some things that he's recognizable. He ate. He even still had the scars. Remember Thomas? Which is an interesting thought to think about, but we're not going to speculate on that here this morning. We look forward to a new body. We look forward to hearts that don't need machines to keep them pumping properly. We look forward to bodies that don't have uh, things like cancer in them anymore that are perfect and pure. We look forward to bodies that don't have things like I have, multiple sclerosis, where the immune system is trying to tax my own brain. We all look forward to those days. We can have a new beginning because he, it takes a new body to have a new beginning. We know we can have a new beginning because Jesus always wins. What am I saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I'm telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, and the mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this, incor when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and the mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory, where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus wins. How do I know that? Because he rose from the dead. I don't have to be afraid to die. As I said Friday night, I could be afraid of how I die, but I don't have to be afraid to die because I don't die. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
He told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. I'm not going someplace where I'm going to burn and have weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm going to a place where Jesus resides. I'm going to be in a place where Jesus shines. I'm going to be in a place where I don't need a sun, the moon, because God himself illuminates heaven. And I don't think that. I know that. Because faith demands it. I love Romans chapter 8. I didn't even do all of it. I probably could have done that, but we won't do that. What can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or Gavin Newsom or the government or anything else you try and put in that way to block you from experiencing the life of resurrection in your life? Amazed at how we get all stuck and live defeated because we let the news dictate our spirits when the Holy Spirit doesn't waste his time on such things. We have resurrection power no matter who's in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. We have resurrection power no matter who is our senator, our congressman, our school board members, our city council people. We as followers of Jesus need to start living that way. The world is looking for church to live in resurrection power, to live supernaturally and not look for false Christ to save them from something that only Jesus can do. As it is written, because you are being put to death all day long, we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors. Hyper Nike. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus wins every time. We know we can have a new beginning because we have a new purpose. Look at how Paul closes this section out. Therefore, my dear brothers, because of everything that I've said to you, because Jesus rose from the dead, here's the experience, here's the witness testimony, here's what your body's going to look like, because resurrection ensures that death has been defeated, sin has been defeated, Jesus' atonement on the cross is, is, is efficacious and works, and he rose from the dead. Therefore, Be steadfast, immovable, always. Say always. always. Guess what always means in Greek? Always. Always, always means always. Be, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We can be grounded and unshaken because we know that what we do for the Lord is not in vain because Jesus rose from the dead. Otherwise, it is in vain. To deal with the headaches, to deal with the aggravation, to deal with the stuff. Jesus gives us new purpose. Let me wrap this up in the few minutes that I have left here. My conclusion is very simple, folks. I don't know who you are out there. I don't know where you're at in here. What new beginning do you need today? You see, here's what I've discovered. There are people who don't know Jesus. They need to have a new beginning today. I also know that there's a lot of followers of Jesus who need to have a new beginning today. I mean, we get, we're starting to get things really brass backwards around here. Maybe you need a new mind. Not just because your spouse told you you were already out of your mind. But 
Or maybe you need a new mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God, the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. The, the imagery here is of the Old Testament, of the altar. It's Isaac willingly laying himself down, even though he was wondering what was going on with his, with his dad up, up on the mountain. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Luke 9, 23. You want a new mind? Something's got to die. Maybe your old mind needs to die. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. You want to know what the God's will is for your life? He wants you to have a new beginning. How are you going to know that? You've got to renew your mind. How do you renew your mind? You've got to lay yourself down. I don't need to do that. I've been a Christian for 505,000 years. I'll tell that to the guy we baptized a little over a year and a half ago who was 91 years old. Please don't tell me transformation is too late for you. Please don't tell me that. As long as you're walking this planet, you still have opportunity for a new beginning in some way, shape, or form. That's how God works. Maybe you need a new focus. Matthew 22, 37 to 39, Jesus says, He said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The greatest is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. They're trying to get him to sum up the whole law. What's the whole law summed up in? It's that right there. Love God, love your neighbor. I'm distracted. I'm easily lit. I'm oh, I'm, 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 I'm blue, 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 blue. Jesus says it's real simple. Love. Love me. Love your neighbor. This is how they'll know you're my disciples. If you love one another. Maybe you're focusing on something else. Maybe you're distracted. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. God, why do you do what you do every day? Some of you are saying, because i got to do something. Maybe you need a new focus. Maybe you need a new purpose. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. People in the world are struggling to find, why am I here? And this is the amazing thing about the atheist or the agnostic who wants to wrestle about these eternal matters. They, they, do you realize, let me, just, let me just be extreme in my illustration here. Do you realize that if there's no afterlife, then ultimately your life is as meaningless as Adolf Hitler's? are the worst person you can think of. Well, I want to leave the world a better place. Is that the legacy that's most important? Why leave this world a better place if this place is all that there is? What's the meaning of existence? Why be married to your spouse forever long you've been married to your spouse? Why, why stick that out? Why, why stick with this? Why live the way Jesus tells us to live this life on earth? Why put up with the nonsense if this is all that there is? The atheist has no answer for that except to say, 
You just die and you go back into the ground. If that's the way you want to go, then that's the way you want to go. Then I'm, then I'm going to ask you, why are you moral? Why does it matter? There's no purpose in that. Eat, drink, be merry, for then we die. We need new purpose. God gives us a purpose. Maybe you need new life. Romans 6, 4, Paul says, Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. Colossians 3, 9 to 11, Paul says, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices that have put and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. When you came to know Jesus as Lord, you got new life. Maybe you need a Savior. John 3, 3, Jesus replied to Nicodemus, He says, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Remember, Nicodemus was the Pharisee. He, he knows the Old Testament. He knows it. He knows his Bible. And Jesus says, how come you can't understand this? And you're a teacher of this stuff. Later on in John 3, 16, he says, For God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You want eternal life, you need a Savior. A Savior from what? Your sins. Jesus died on the cross for your sins in your place. He's incurred the wrath of God. And can you imagine? I mean, he was on the cross for quite a few hours to incur the wrath of all humanity for all mankind, for all eternity. That's it. Once and for all. We talked about this Friday night. Once and for all, Jesus died for sin. Amen. You want to have meaning, purpose, life, a new mind? You need to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. There's just no other way around it. Maybe you need a new home. 1 Peter 3, 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of His great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope. Are you dead in this room? You are alive. You are living Guess what you're supposed to leave this place doing, especially on this Easter Sunday, but every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you are supposed to be a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Isn't that great to know? All that stuff you're saving up in your garage that you say you think's going to come back. I love those insurance commercials where they, the guy has the baseboards. He goes, I keep these baseboards in the progress. Or the insurance guy says, I know when you'll use them again. Never. They throw them in the trash. Amen. Hallelujah. What we hope for, what we live for, what we exist for, the reason we have a new beginning, the reason we want a new beginning, because that which is imperishable and eternal is not here in what is perishable and eternal. It is up in heaven. As followers of Jesus, we know that God is a God of new beginnings because of the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We pray your blessings. As we celebrate this day, Lord, as we're traveling and seeing family and doing all those things, I pray for a blessing around that. May your light, your hope shine through us. To those that we know that we may be eating with, hanging out with today, have no hope. Or their hope is in this world. 
Lord, let us leave this place with resurrection power and living hope. Our faith demands it. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Pray you have a blessed Easter. We'll see you next week here at First Baptist. Not, not First Baptist. We are Living Hope Church. Have a great week.